Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We are super excited uh, to have you to celebrate what has been uh, an interesting year, to say the least. Uh, more than anything this year, I am just so incredibly proud of our team for persevering through what has been a challenging year. Uh, and included in that team is uh, an incredible board that supports our work. It's obviously the staff of adventure scientists. It's our incredible network of donor partners that uh, believe in the work that we're doing and uh, choose to put their dollars to work through our organization. And it's the volunteers. And we're going to celebrate uh, and hear from four of those volunteers tonight. Uh, my name is Greg Trinish. I'm the founder and executive director of the organization. And uh, again, just couldn't be more thrilled than to celebrate this year. Uh, and it is worthy of celebration, as you'll hear from our team tonight. Uh, we're going to start with a quick video. Uh, this will just be about a minute and a half, and then I'll be right back with you. Thanks. Because of adventure scientists, the entire world was now available to study. Adventure scientists expands where we can go with the research. Adventure scientists was recruiting extremely capable people in the wilderness. Going to places where other people generally don't go. Giving us the ability to look at organisms and habitats that we had not been able to. Pretty much anything's available now. All right, so our first speaker tonight uh, is Emily Hamill. Um, Emily is a PhD student studying environmental health at Boston University. Uh, she's an avid bike enthusiast and loves adventure scientists, mission to facilitate high quality data collection for environmental researchers. She's had the unique opportunity to volunteer with the Wildlife Connectivity Project this summer while bikepacking through the Beartooth Mountains in Montana and the Bighorn and Pryor Mountains in Wyoming. And this Wildlife Connectivity Project is uh, one of the projects that we've had going for a long time at Adventure Scientists. We've done this both globally and now in Montana as well. Uh, we're covering roads across the entire state. And this project is all about finding and identifying the hotspots where wildlife are crossing roadways and where they are getting hit by cars. This poses an incredible risk. The numbers of this are staggering. Over 360 million animals a year. That's 1 million animals every single day are killed on America's roadways. And by identifying exactly where that's happening, where those animal crossings are concentrated, mitigation becomes much more possible and much more feasible. We can't have overpasses and underpasses everywhere. We can't have signage everywhere. So by finding those places and targeting that, uh, our partners at the uh, government and at NGOs around the country are able to utilize the data to prioritize those mitigation technologies. So without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Emily. Great, thank you, Greg. Give me a second to share my screen here. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Um, as Greg introduced, um, I got the chance to collect roadkill data this summer, uh, which was a ton of fun. And um, I'm excited to share a little bit more about my volunteer experience with Adventure Scientists um, and show you some great pictures of our, of our route and our journey along the way. Um, so sometime back in, I wanna say May, there's an Instagram post uh, on the Adventure Scientist account that had some stunning, beautiful photo of the Beartooth Highway. And I immediately commented and tagged some of my friends, you know, with a little like eyeball emojis, like, hey, you guys wanna go do this? And um, it kind of took off from there. And I think trying to describe to my friends and my family that I was gonna go 
uh, bike pack and collect roadkill data um, definitely raised a couple of eyebrows. There were questions about like, are you going to be strapping, you know, animals to your bike? What what does that entail? And so I learned a lot about what we were going to set out to go do. A good friend of mine, um, Max Littlefield, works with you all at Adventure Scientist, and he got us totally up to speed with our training um, and using the Montana Connectivity app, which I took a couple screenshots here just to, you know, let people know this was the kind of data collection we were working with. Uh, we were picking up animals and bringing them on our bikes. Uh, but we did stop and we took pictures of um, the different roadkill that we saw along our way and we were able to collect good data on um, where that was in the road and any sort of infrastructure pieces that might have been um, nearby that would be important for researchers addressing this topic. Um, so, you know, this was an interesting experience, uh, collecting data while setting out on our own little adventure. Um, the Beartooth Highway climbs up from Red Lodge, Montana. It's about, I don't know, 15 or 20 miles of climbing. It's about 6,000 feet of vertical gain um, in that climb. So it was definitely, we had our work cut out for ourselves and we'd be stopping along the way to take uh, photos of, um, of roadkill as we went. And as you can see here, we loaded up our bikes. We set out on this climb. Um, some, some moments we felt like we had our serious researchers hat on. Um, other moments, we, we definitely didn't take our ourselves too seriously. We had a good time with it. Um, but as a researcher myself, I really have such an appreciation for um, the, the scientists who are designing these incredibly complex and far reaching studies and then relying on volunteers to collect and generate high quality data. Uh, so it was really cool to be able to participate as a volunteer in this project um, and contribute to that um, to that field um, and for the researchers uh, who were who were behind the scenes here. Um, so I actually I worked with two of my close friends um, who joined me on this, and uh, Matt and Connor, who I'm sure they're somewhere in the webinar um, audience out there, but they agreed to this. And we signed up, we got all trained with the adventure scientists and we actually extended this to a seven day bike packing trip through Montana and Wyoming, um, which was spectacular and such a cool opportunity to disconnect um, from our screens, load up our bikes and hit the road and really enjoy the, the simplicity of, of bike touring. Um, and what made this trip so special beyond getting the chance to contribute to, you know, my field of environmental health and environmental science. Um, but, you know, beyond that and spending seven days with two of my best friends, um, there was sort of a, a larger significance for this trip for me. And uh, several years ago, I lost a friend of mine on a bike trip across the country. Um, and she was hit by a driver who was texting and driving. Um, and I think every time being able to get back out on the bike is such a powerful reminder of what a gift that is um, and what a gift it is to be able to enjoy the outdoors of the people we care about, um, especially in the context of where our world is today. Um, and being able to take that time this summer to unplug and reflect and, um, you know, really be able to be mindful of the things that, you know, we never want to take for granted um, and, you know, highlight those things that are most important to us. Um, so it was a really spectacular summer, um, such a great opportunity to combine what I love, science and biking with two of the people I love most. Um, and I'm really appreciative for the opportunity to get involved with you all this summer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily, that was incredible. And uh, yeah, really appreciate you sharing your story, your perseverance. If there's a theme for this year, it's certainly that for all of us and to get back on your bike after uh, such a uh, difficult loss. I'm sorry to hear that and appreciate you sharing that story with us. Um, really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, our next project uh, that we're gonna highlight is the timber tracking project. So many of you know about this project. I'm sure a lot of the attendees on the call have uh, participated as volunteers in this project. Uh, and that's because our team led by Michelle and Janiel on the project management team have sent volunteers all across the West to collect samples for different species of commercially important trees. And so these trees, again, the numbers on these things are staggering. We had no idea getting involved in this, 
but $150 billion a year are stolen from forests around the world. Now here in the US, this is a really big problem and obviously not the $150 billion problem it is globally, but we have trees that are poached out of forests each year. We started it in 2017 with big leaf maple and over the last few years, we've been able to expand that to three more species. Uh, and our next speaker, Ren Wagenbach, is gonna share her story of collecting timber uh, data for this project. And Ren is a 19 year old born and raised in Seattle. She's currently an undergraduate in her second year at McGill University in Montreal. She majors in environmental science with a focus on ecological determinants of health. And just a reminder to everybody, you can uh, submit questions for any of our speakers using the Q&A feature. If you just put in their name at the beginning of your question and we're gonna save all those for the end and answer questions at the end. Uh, and after Ren's presentation here, we'll have a little interlude with some trivia questions. So Ren, take it away. We're so excited to hear from you. Hello. Okay, so yeah, my name's Ren. Uh, I was in Seattle this summer and it was my first time volunteering with Adventure Scientists and obviously I did their timber tracking project. Um, the way that the volunteering uh, situation went for me is I applied online and then um, Adventure Scientists had me do a training and I completed all the online stuff and then they sent me all the tools and materials that I would need. It was really, um, well organized and the info was all presented super clearly. Um, the trees I was looking for were Alaska yellow cedar and it was a bit funny because I initially applied to look um, to look for western red cedars which as most people know have um, citrusy smelling pine needles or needles and um, cones shaped kind of like roses uh, but adventure scientists needed yellow cedar samples so I switched over and I was Googling Alaskan yellow cedars to prepare and um, Wikipedia said that their needles smelled like mildew, the bark smelled like potatoes and they look a little weepy. So not super great selling points, but I found the mildew claim to be quite exaggerated. And I think yellow cedars actually have quite a lot of character after a summer looking for them. And now they're my favorite tree. So because COVID hit Seattle quite hard, I've been in isolation mode since um, March, obviously, but finding adventure scientists was a really awesome pandemic activity for me. Um, I used the apps that they provided or recommended to find hikes that looked promising based on elevation or topography or the habitats that yellow cedars usually live in. And then my dad and I would just drive to various national forests around Washington so that I could find trees to sample. So Alaskan yellow cedars are much more challenging to find compared to red cedars. And the first hike that I took out in the Olympics was a bit of a bust because although the trail we chose was at the right elevation, um, we were on the wrong side of the mountain relative to the ocean as we found out because it was way too dry for them to grow. So after a couple hours of hiking, we gave up and drove around just a little bend um, in the road. And the other side of the mountain was just totally covered in yellow cedars. Um, so that was a really cool experience. And then after that, I definitely got a bit better at finding the right habitats. Um, I found it was kind of like trying to solve a puzzle and then when I finally would stumble upon them, it was really rewarding. Um, so overall, it was quite an awesome experience. Got me outside safely during a pandemic and obviously totally bolstered my tree knowledge. So I'm definitely going to try to get some more sampling done before 2020 ends. And I'm sure I'll be back next summer. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was amazing. Um, so this work is so important because what's happening is you take these samples and they go to our labs at, uh, they go to our partner labs rather at the U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, 
And they're creating these genetic reference libraries and chemical reference libraries from across these entire species so that when then poachers have suspected wood that shows up, they can compare the wood that the poachers have with the wood from these standing trees from across the range. And it's just so incredible that we've got volunteers like you, Ren, and like hundreds of others that have been out there participating in these projects, helping us build these reference libraries, which are already being put to use uh, to make a difference. So we're just so incredibly proud of this work. Thanks again for a great presentation, Ren. Uh, next, we're going to move on to our first trivia question, a little bit of an interlude, so you can stand up and stretch your legs. Uh, we're going to open up the polling here so that you can vote. The first question here is possibly the oldest river in America is actually also a wild and scenic river. And the question to you is, which river is it? Is it the New River, the American, the St. Croix, or the Colorado? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Get your answers in, a few seconds left. All right. It looks like most of you thought that it was the Colorado River, and you are wrong. Sorry about that. The answer is D, the new river, and it's America's oldest river it, uh, is in West Virginia. Uh, while it's tough to date the river, there's evidence that it's actually older than the Appalachian Mountains that it cuts through, and it's potentially up to 320 million years old. Uh, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado is actually only six to 70 million years old. And also the Colorado River, it's never actually been designated a wild and scenic river, so you should have known better. All right, on to the next question here. Our second question is, where does the world's oldest known individual tree live? And your choices are California, British Columbia, China, or Greece. We are going to be giving away prizes at the end of the presentation, but they're not going to actually be tied to whether you got the right answer or not. So you can feel free to guess away. All right, a few more seconds. All right, looks like most of you said California, 56% of you guessed California and you are correct. However, I'm guessing you probably were thinking of the giant sequoias. And so if so, it's the right state, but the wrong tree. Uh, the oldest living tree is a 5,069 year old bristlecone pine in the California White Mountains. It began growing around the time that humans were learning how to make metal tools. It's not the oldest organism though. There's a colony of aspen trees called Pando that lives in Utah. And they think that it could be up to 80,000 years old or as long as 2020 feels to some of us. All right, and we'll do one final trivia question here. And this one is car headlights pick up the eye shine or colored reflection from the eyes of animals along the roadway at night. Which of the following animals does not have eye shine? And your choices are humans, moose, bear, or owls. We should have planned for some Jeopardy music here. Spare you and not hum for you. It 
see that 15 of you haven't voted yet. Get your votes in. All right, a few seconds to wrap up. Neck and neck here between humans and owls. All right. So the majority of you thought owls do not have eye shine. The answer is A, humans. And humans don't have eye shine, neither do pigs, kangaroos, camels, or many other animals that are active during the daytime. The eye shine is actually caused by a mirror-like uh, membrane called a tapetum lucidium. And that is there to help nocturnal animals make the most of low light. So they bounce around the light in their eyes, uh, getting it to the photoreceptors. And while people who have almost hit a moose might swear that they don't have eye shine, it's because moose are so tall and their heads are above headlight beams of most cars. So great job on those polls. Pass yourself on the back if you got all three right. You can give yourself a nice uh, self-hug as a prize uh, and stick around till the end and you will be uh, given a chance to win prizes from our incredible sponsors. All right, our next speaker is Trisha. Uh, she is a whitewater kayaker, a public health practitioner, a writer. She works for Washington State Department of Agriculture managing their hemp program. But when she's not in the fields, she's on the river catching surf and now collecting water samples for our Wild and Scenic Rivers project. This project is a multi-year partnership with three federal agencies and supporting over 40 state agencies. And we are conducting these uh, comprehensive water quality analyses across the Wild and Scenic River system, which unfortunately our government officials just don't have the resources to adequately measure. So volunteers like Tricia who get out there, increase our manager's ability to pr properly protect these rivers, to properly manage these rivers and to divert the limited resources that exist towards the restoration of these essential waterways. So off to you, Tricia, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, gonna share my screen. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Tricia Ehrlich and I did my first wild and scenic river trip in 2007 and I've been compulsively chasing rivers, specifically wild and scenic rivers ever since. Uh, from 2009 to 2016, I worked as a river guide on exclusively wild and scenic rivers. Um, and my first river trip was about an hour and a half long. And by the end of my career, I was guiding 18 day long river trips. Um, the longer I could be out there, the better. And I think that was why I was so compelled by wild and scenic rivers. The idea of going deeper, further into this wilderness experience. Um, while I really wanted to just live on rivers for an eternity, my back and shoulders had a, a limited opportunity to row 18 foot gear boats. So I went to public health school where I still kind of stayed curious about what it meant to be involved with in relationship to wild and scenic rivers, why some of us got to access these incredible and wild places and why others didn't have the time or financial, um, you know, resources to access the wild. And at the same time, I was starting to do research in public health school and realizing that all the barriers that I had found in the wilderness, I was also seeing in research with knowledge deeply embedded in institutions and people, um, as we see in 2020, uh, not certain about their trust or comfort in what science has to offer us. So I was really excited about um, volunteering with adventure scientists because it felt like the best of both worlds, the breaking down of barriers in adventure and the breaking down of barriers in science. Um, you know, in the world of adventure, we often celebrate the most extreme of athletes who are running waterfalls and, um, climbing without ropes. And we also celebrate kind of the extreme institutions of science. And so it was really great when I went to collect this Illabot Creek sample. Um, I think I hiked about a half a mile to meet the wild and scenic boundary and 
through flat surfaces. It was very simple. It was very easy access. And then I got to try out working with this field equipment that I hadn't touched since high school um, and was able to even practice in a bowl of water in my kitchen. So to me, when we think about what are the barriers to people both trusting in science and feeling like adventure is something that, and the wilderness is something that they can be a part of and protect, it's citizen science. It's one of the huge answers of just getting regular people like me um, to go out and be a part of science. Um, I went on an early season winter mission deep to the gorge of Illibot, which we found to be both unrunnable by boat due to wood and partially unrunnable with a kayak stack by car due to wood on the road. Um, but luckily the wild and scenic boundary is about a quarter mile from the main bridge. So you don't necessarily have to go over a pass to access the samples. Um, my first sample was pretty much in the summer and I just went out in a tank top and flip flops. And my most recent sample was full dry suit, PFD, very cold conditions. Um, but I was really excited to be a part of the project and I love wild and scenic rivers and I am so glad to see uh, citizen science making its way forward. So thank you for having me and feel free to reach out with any questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Trisha. I love this idea of breaking down barriers to adventure and, and it's what sets our volunteers apart and what makes this community so special is you guys are just people who can figure out how to get it done. And it's really amazing to see that in action. Thanks so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Uh, as a reminder, please do submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, it should just pop up as Q&A. You can type them in there and our panelists will address those questions at the end. Um, this next speaker, Bethany, uh, who worked on our pollinators project uh, and I have known each other for quite a few years now. Um, Bethany uh, recently uh, hiked 11,000 miles, paddled 1,000 miles and bike packed over 2,000 miles along with her travel partner, Lord and Reed. And uh, one of the reasons that we became so close is that uh, many of you know, I before I started Adventure Scientists, uh, backpacked the length of the Andes Mountains uh, from the equator to the southern tip of, of South America. It was one of the driving forces that led me to create this organization. And Bethany and Lauren have uh, literally followed in my footsteps down there. What's so special for me is that they were able to collect data while they were doing this and bring the meaning to the trip that uh, was really lacking for me. Um, there was a ton of meeting and I'll never diminish the experience I had down there, um, but I consistently was searching for a way that I could give back in a way that I could do more uh, with my experience down there. And so uh, through their treat, chip, excuse me, through their trip, uh, I, it was really amazing for me to be able to watch uh, that happening and to be able to provide uh, them with a little bit of this mission. Um, and they had quite a bit of their own mission as well, which I'm sure Bethany will share with you. Uh, Bethany collected data for a number of our projects, but among them was the Pollinator Project. And this project, uh, again, happening with one of these hybrids where it's happening both globally and uh, across six Western states. Um, it was an effort to fill in data gaps that uh, exist because overwhelmingly in the 90s of percent, the, the data that come in uh, for pollinators happen within a mile of a trailhead. And our volunteers are able to get into these remote areas and we, we really pride ourselves on the ability to get data at a scale uh, that others just, with other models, you just can't do. And so we do that with the pollinators project, both spatially, meaning across large geographies, but we also can do it temporally. So we have repeat visitors on this project as well. And we're looking at biodiversity and how biodiversity is changing in these remote ecosystems. We're looking at the flowers that call them uh, home and that they rely on for food, uh, which really helps indicate the health of these overall ecosystems. And again, this is a partnership with the managers who are then able to take our data and use it to indicate things like the times of burning, uh, other uh, management actions that they can take uh, replanting of, of native species, removals of invasive species, the list goes on for the outcomes that can come from these data. Uh, and so again, we're so thankful to the incredible group of volunteers 
uh, that can do this. So Bethany, take it away. Awesome, thank you very much, Greg. All right, hi everybody. As he said, I'm Bethany Hughes. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to share my screen. So that means I'll stop sharing others' screens. And my forte happens to be wilderness travel as opposed to technology. <laughs> so I hope that you guys can be patient with me while I open the wrong tabs in front of everyone. Uh, here we go. I am so sorry. As you guys can see, I am working on a book right now. So I have about 40 different tabs open and I don't know where my adventure scientist one went. So I'll go ahead and just start with my introduction of um, her odyssey. And her odyssey has been a journey to travel the length of the Americas by non-motorized means, connecting the story of the land and its inhabitants. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen while I talk. And very much this journey um, began with Greg as a very, um, as a key part of that. He was the first digital tracks that I was able to find that crossed the Americas. And um, that was basically the only information that I had that I was able to bring to uh, my family and people who I was convincing about this journey um, that it actually was doable. So, all right, I thought I had my adventure scientist tab up. Yep. And here we go. Thank you guys for your patience on this. Into presenter mode. Perfect. So, since 2015, my hiking partner, Lauren Reed, and I um, have been traveling the length of the Americas by human power. And our mission behind this is to connect the story of the land and its inhabitants. Um, these are all of my slides. There we go. So we're two women on a human power journey across the Americas, connecting the story of the land and its inhabitants. The name of the journey is Her Odyssey. The map that you see on the right is what we've completed so far. The red lines were hiking, the blue lines were paddling. Um, some was in mostly primarily in kayaks. And then the orange lines that you begin to see around Northern America um, was bike packing. Um, our connection with, with Adventure Scientists began actually before her odyssey did. My hiking partner, Lauren Reed, actually was contributing um, information to a PICA study that they had. But where we were particularly following as we were hiking through Patagonia was that that aligned with the time that Adventure Scientists was conducting their microplastic study, which became um, very important and, and relevant to us as we walked along the Southern Patagonian um, glacier fields. And it was that ability to initially observe the work of adventure scientists and to learn from it um, that really began to engage us. And we were having a lot of conversations about flowing of water. And as Greg talked about the work that he did in order to share his route, and we realized we were receiving so much from adventure scientists that we were really excited to find a way to give back. The First way that we began to actively be able to give back was when we were on the Capacnian, the um, Incan Trail, and that started around northern Argentina and continues on as far north as southern Colombia. Um, at that time, I got involved in um, the roadkill study because it, it aligned with one of my personal interests of um, photographing death and decay. And so if you have a quirky penchant, and it can contribute to science, why would you not want to merge those two things? Um, the cool thing about the Capacnian is that the Incas were such incredible road builders that um, many of their routes have now actually been covered over by modern, I'm trying to move my video screen off so you guys can see the photos there. Um, a lot of highways had been built over where the Capacnian had. So oftentimes our route would intersect with that. And I was able to do what I like to do, which was take pictures 
um, of the interesting um, and sometimes violent intersection of lives. So here I was on the salt flats outside of Uyuni in Bolivia and these, uh, a baby guanaco. It was really interesting to observe those patterns. When um, that project kind of pivoted and began to focus more onto, for those of you guys, for those of y'all who are um, into road biking, now that's primarily focused on this area, I believe in Montana um, and road biking, and that's beautiful. So we got shifted over, very lucky for us, into the pollinators project. The difference between photographing roadkill and photographing butterflies is that when you're taking pictures of it, roadkill doesn't get up and run away. And for those of you who've spent any amount of time with a backpack on know that it takes uh, thinking twice to decide to bend down with the backpack on to be able to catch photos. Um, so in doing that, and this was a big part of my personal experience of working with adventure scientists, was that I'd gone from a stage of observing and learning from all of the amazing work that you guys put out to engaging with it with the Roadkill Project. And with the Pollinators Project, I was really able to dig in, um, dig in not only to the landscapes that we were traveling through and observing the butterflies, um, and also dig into what is the mission of our journey of her odyssey, which is this, this connection, is this working together and the symbiosis of all of these different lives that we went past. Um, so in that way, the Pollinators Project um, was an invitation for us to, to slow down um, and to observe the world around us more. One of the really fortunate things about butterflies patterns is that they are more active during, or at least we saw them most during the warmer times of the day. And that became a reason in order to be able to contribute uh, well-rounded information for adventure scientists that we would take longer lunch breaks than what I would on a normal through hike, taking an hour, an hour and a half, sometimes up to two hours, uh, just dropping our backpacks and sitting and, and watching the, the incredible natural spaces that we were getting to move through and to watch how, um, how life existed in those places. So it was one of the comforting things and it made me feel, it brought my experience of the hike in line with nature to realize how our patterns were similar to those of animals, that some of these butterflies were migrating along the same path that we're working on walking and paddling. Um, it was also fortunate because on the Capacan, we're going through Peru and Peru is host to 20%, I believe of the world's known butterfly species. I think there's over like 37 or 3,000, yeah, 3,700 different species of butterflies through Peru. So we're able to see a lot of that. We also, through the pollinators study and watching these butterflies became aware of the conflict around them that to learn that ahead of us in some of the areas of Mexico that, that people have been killed um, in the conflict between logging and butterfly activists. And so not only was it a chance to learn more about the bigger picture and to dig into the details and the beauty of the world around us, but in order to do that, it involved slowing down, which is not a trait that is generally celebrated in the through hiking community. Um, as some of the other volunteers have talked about, you know, it's it's not about being the fastest or, or the most um, Instagrammable. It's, it's about showing up in those spaces. So for me, adventure scientists played a very important part in shifting my perspective from progress to presence. And I saw that flower out into so many other components of our journey of slowing down and hanging out with the street dogs who had come up of observing the trash along the way of getting to stop and speak in schools or speak with some of the indigenous groups that we were going past um, in the top right i was dressing the wound of a woman who oh that's a oh um or talking to the Cholitas through the mountains there, um, through the Andes was 
an incredible experience. So that's the way that for me, adventure scientists not only taught us, invited us to engage when I never would have thought that I had anything to do with science. That was a chance to dig into the inner workings of the life that was around us. And that opened up our minds to and our awareness to all of the incredible things around us. So thank you for existing and for, for connecting us to this very important work. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, so awesome to hear from you. Uh, you guys can Google a John Bauer Master episode of his talk show with Bethany and I too, if you wanna hear more about her journey uh, or mine as well. Um, why don't we uh, move on to the Q&A and if uh, all four of you panelists would turn on your cameras, we'll just have everybody on screen here. And I actually, I, I've got a question I wanna start with and, and I think a lot of you touched on this, um, but I'm just curious now that, you know, some of you have collected data for us earlier in the year and some are still collecting data for us. Um, one of the things that I've loved most about uh, working in science and, and uh, being a field biologist when I was, is just the way that it changes the lens at which I look at nature. And, um, you know, I love this concept, Bethany, that you just shared of, of progress to presence. And I'm wondering if the rest of you could speak to that, um, or maybe two of you or something could speak to that. Just how, when you now go on a hike, even if you're not collecting data for adventure scientists or anybody, how it's changed your experience of how you see nature and how you experience nature. I can speak to that really briefly. I know that um, it's made me slow down a lot more. I try to like see if I can identify the trees or different plants and stuff, like to stop and smell things a lot more than I used to. So that's been kind of fun. I'm happy to chime in. I think, um, you know, from my own maybe somewhat biased lens, I think learning stuff is really cool. And uh, I think when you engage in sort of the scientific process, so to speak, that adventure scientists sort of opens that door for, I think every time you go back out and you're hiking with someone or you're biking with someone and you get to share that fun tidbit that you get to kind of share that experience. And I think I think that's something that um, resonates with a lot of people. You know, learning stuff is cool. And whether it's a fun fact you can share at the dinner table with your roommates or your family, um, I think that this, this whole process really facilitates learning for everyone involved. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. Um, Cool, so we've got a question from Jim uh, for uh, Tricia. Uh, he says, great presentation. Uh, Jim has been a board member at Adventure Scientists and he's been one of my mentors and, and coaches and just can't say enough about how amazing Jim is. Uh, and along with how amazing he is, he's 84 years old and would still love to be rafting, uh, but he was just curious if you ever, ever spent time on the New River or the Gauley River in West Virginia. And I haven't, I am a West Coast gal now. My first wild and scenic experience was on the East Coast, but now I'm in North Bend, Washington, but Golly Fest is a very famous thing in the white water community. So I feel like I will have to make the pilgrimage at some point in my life to go to Golly Fest and do the Golly in the New. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, from Mike Herring, uh, for any of the volunteers, uh, when you tell your friends and family about your experiences, what messages about the project resonates the most with them? What makes people want to be part of these efforts? I find the thing that engages the people the most, like I just got off of work and was talking about doing this presentation about pollinators and one of the, the people coming through was talking about the milkweed in his yard and how that because of that growing he started to notice the monarchs and he noticed over the years the decrease in the number and had been wondering why. So I think one of the strongest ways as a proud representative of adventure scientists and ex always excited to talk about it is that that connection begins in people's backyards. It's getting them into the area around them. If you can connect with the area that they're already connected with um, that's a that's a main line to the human soul, I believe. That's 
That's great. Did anybody else want to jump in on that one? I think something that resonated with a lot of folks that I spoke to was the fact that anyone can do this. Like, how'd you get involved with that? Well, it's, it's volunteering. Anyone can do it. And I think that that um, was a really cool thing that maybe people haven't thought that they could also get involved with these types of projects um, and things that they can do sort of beyond their day to day to, to volunteer. Right. We've got another question um, for our Ren. Uh, we don't know who exactly who it's from, but uh, somebody says that they recognize you from the super inspiring youth climate change lawsuit that's gone to the Supreme Court. Do you plan to continue working on climate change issues at university and beyond? Um, and feel yeah. free to share about what, feel free to fill the audience in on what that is too. Yeah, I've been a plaintiff on the Washington um, case through our children's trust um, since I was in uh, middle school, I think, and I'm in undergrad now. Um, essentially, it's trying to get Washington to implement a plan based on um, legitimate science to lower emissions. Um, but in reference to my future, um, I'm studying, yeah, I'm studying, I'm majoring in the environment, de uh, ecolog ecological determinants of health. So I'm hoping that I can combine my interest in diseases uh, with my interest in the environment because climate change is going to cause a lot of shifts in diseases and pandemics as we've seen. Amazing. Uh, for Bethany, uh, there is a lag on, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, for Bethany, do you or your hiking partners speak Spanish? And if not, how did you find hiking in South America in the most remote areas? It's a really good question. Um, my connection to South America is actually that I grew up there from the time I was four until I was about 14. Um, so my parents threw me into an all Spanish speaking preschool and the first day I came home from school and informed my parents that I thought it would be easier to teach all of them how to speak English. And by the end of the year, I had taught most of my uh, fellow students how to speak some English and I have been able to speak Spanish since that time and hiking in South America in the terms of long distance hiking is still a relatively new concept. So it was really fun to be um, a female bodied person on the front end of introducing this idea of long distance journeying and, and doing it because you love it. That's right. Uh, Bethany, I know when I was there, um, Spanish actually only got me so far when I was in the most remote places, it was, it was Quechua and Amira. Was that mm -hmm. your experience too? Yeah, very much so. And that they don't have that they don't, that they have their own roots. So I was able to um, pick up a couple of words in each of the languages in order to be able to, to communicate at least to some degree, or at least communicate goodwill to the folks who, who we um, were traveling amongst. But the journey of those languages is also very fascinating. South America has over 400 different languages. Fun fact, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Emily, how'd you hear about us? How'd you hear about Adventure Scientists? Uh, yeah, actually, well, so a good friend of mine, Max, has worked with you all in Bozeman for the last little bit now. Um, so I had sort of heard about, um, you know, what he did with Adventure Scientists and how he got involved. And I, of course, followed you all on Instagram. Um, and, and I think it was putting those dots together that, oh, this is something that anyone can do. And this is something I hear Max talk about all the time and his job seems super cool. Um, and he and his friends have done a lot of the wildlife connectivity segments. They sort of have it as a, you know, sort, not a duty, but sort of like a thing they check off their list every data collection season where they get out and they go ride a few segments. Um, so it seemed really cool that, you know, anyone could sign up and, and volunteer. Um, so we gave him a call. It was me, Matt and Connor. We were on speakerphone and they're like, talk us through this. What does this look like? And it was really cool to hear the training that was all set up and how well organized everything was. It made it really easy to jump in as a new volunteer. Awesome. Way to go recruiting your friends, Max. I appreciate that if you're on the line. If not, I'll tell you that tomorrow. 
Uh, next question is for Tricia. Uh, what is your favorite wild and scenic river and or which one are you dying to visit? Ooh, good question. Okay, well, so my favorite wild and scenic river is the Middle Fork Salmon, and that is in Idaho. It's uh, 100 miles of wild and scenic river, and I spent most of my 20s on it, so I just have like very warm feelings of like this whole world within the Middle Fork Salmon. Um, what am I dying to go see? So I get to, I'm actually going to go with adventure scientists to collect samples on the Checo River this spring. And that is in Southern Oregon. It's in the same drainage as like the Rogue and the Illinois. It's a 10 mile hike in. Um, it's a little bit of a torture fest, which I like those. And it's this steep class four plus ish kind of creaky gorge. Um, and a group of my friends and I are going to go check that out. So that's kind of the next wild and scenic river that I'm really excited to check out. Awesome. Jealous of that. <laughs> you got that river before I could sign up for it. <laughs> uh, from Jackie Taylor, uh, Ren, did your project always follow man-made paths in the national parks or did you have to go off road, so to speak? Uh, just curious how you navigate collecting data and following park guidelines. Um, so Adventure Scientists provides um, permits getting into parks for a lot of areas and a lot of the parks in Washington. And so once you sign up to be a volunteer, you get access to the permits and they show you maps of all the locations. And then um, you just show the permit to the people working at the gates and you get in, don't have to pay, which is really awesome. Really, I think increases the accessibility of adventure scientists and um yeah we stayed on the trails most of the permits specify that they don't want you going far off the trails so it's dependent on the parks for sure and then there are some who want you to not be visible sampling from the trails so it goes both ways i can cool uh, and this will be our last question. And for any of the volunteers, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in terms of motivating others to engage with the environment and how have you ever overcome those? And that's from uh, Anthony and Catherine Lee. Hi guys. So again, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you faced in terms of motivating others to engage with the environment and how have you overcome those challenges? A lot of the, the challenges that we faced, both I think in North and South America were the, the preconceived notions that people have, whether uh, this is how, how, how things are going in nature or this is how capable I am or what it is that I have to offer. Um, for myself, it was daunting to, like scientists, man, these are lab coats and indoors and words that I don't know. And so to bridge that gap, what I found is I use something that I've learned called motivational interviewing techniques and, and essentially asking the, the person themselves questions and letting them talk themselves into realizing that actually, yes, I do have valuable information to contribute and my observations of the world are just as valid as the perspectives that are being shared with me through the television or through news or through other people's experiences. Awesome. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? I will say that I think one of the things that is hardest for people is losing control. Um, you know, we live in a very scheduled society. We have our phones with us. We have us, we're supposed to be at this place at this time and it's gonna be warm and dry. And when you invite people to have those kind of wilderness experiences, you don't get to be in control. Um, Mother nature has the final say, whether you like it or not. And even the best laid plans can just change in a moment. And I know it was the hardest thing for me to figure out, especially on rivers that you don't know what the flow is until you wake up and that's all you can do. Um, and you just have to kind of pack and prepare mentally for whatever reality you get into. And 
for me, it's been a really healthy thing to integrate into my adult world, even though it was not the way I was raised. And I see how hard it is to kind of bring people into that and realize that you cannot know, you cannot have a plan and you can be okay. Um, so I think that that's, that's a big one. Amazing. Um, I am in complete awe of each of the four of you. Thank you guys so, so much for being here and sharing your stories with us. Uh, we have three giveaways, so stick around and uh, we'll be picking three winners uh, for prizes from our amazing sponsors. Uh, so for our first prize, uh, this is a pair of sun skis, uh, a pair of croquis and uh, a mere uh, 12 ounce camp cup. Uh, the winner of this one is Tim Marchant. Uh, so Tim, we've got your email address and we'll be in touch. Uh, and if uh, you'll hear from us, and I won't say if you don't hear from us, because you will. Um, thanks to our sponsors for those. Our second prize is from Peak Designs. Uh, we get one of their everyday slings and two mere 16 ounce pint glasses. And the winner of that is Colleen Haskell. Congratulations, Colleen. You are the big winner. And we have your email as well, and we'll be in touch with you. And our third prize is an adventure scientist hat, uh, an OR jacket, an outdoor research jacket, and a mere 20 ounce tumbler, the big grand prize here. Uh, thanks again to all our, our incredible sponsors for bringing us these gifts. We could not do our work without you and are so thankful for you. And Maria Peterson is going to be taking those home today. All right. So everybody, thank you so, so much. Again, you are part of our family. We cannot do our work without you. And everybody who has been a volunteer for us, who has been part of our family in one way or another, even if you're just learning about adventure scientists, uh, you are absolutely amazing. And we're just so thankful to have you as part of our network. Um, everybody, please stay safe and have a great rest of your year. Um, just a reminder that we do have an, a $10,000 match on small gifts. Um, you can go to our website, adventurescientist.org slash donate. We are accepting gifts through the end of the year and then throughout next year as well. Um, we really do rely on philanthropic support to meet our mission and we cannot thank you enough uh, for the support you provide. Thank you all again for being here. Please do stay safe. Have a great rest of the year and a happy holidays. And let's all hope that 2021 is every bit as fun as 2020 has been. Thank you so much.